The Strange Letter of a Lunatic by James Hogg. In the original, the letter was presented as a letter sent to Mr. James Hogg of Mount Benjamin. Sir, as you seem to have been born for the purpose of collecting all the whimsical and romantic stories of this country, I've taken the fancy of sending to you an account of a most painful and unaccountable one that happened to myself, and at the same time leave you at liberty to make what use of it you please. An explanation of the circumstances from you would give me great satisfaction. Last summer, in June, I happened to be in Edinburgh, and walking very early on the Castle Hill one morning, I perceived a strange-looking figure of an old man watching all my motions, as if anxious to introduce himself to me yet still kept at the same distance. I beckoned him, on which he came waddling briskly up, and taking an elegant gold snuff-box set with jewels from his pocket, he offered me a pinch. I accepted of it most readily, and then, without speaking a word, he took his box again, thrust it into his pocket, and went away, chuckling and laughing in perfect ecstasy. He was even so overjoyed that, in hobbling down the platform, he would leap from the ground, clap his hands on his loins, and laugh immoderately. The devil, I'm sure, is in that body, said I to myself. What does he mean? Let me see. I wish I may be well enough. I feel very queer since I took that snuff of it. I stood there, I do not know how long, like one who had been knocked on the head, until I thought I saw the body peering at me from a shady place in the rock. I hasted to him, but on going up, I found myself standing there. Yes, sir. Myself. My own likeness every respect. I was turned to a rigid statue at once. The unaccountable being went down the hill convulsed with laughter. I felt very uncomfortable all that day, and at night, having adjourned from the theatre with a party to a celebrated tavern well known to you, judge of my astonishment when I saw another me sitting at the other end of the table. I was struck speechless and began to watch this unaccountable fellow's motions and perceived that he was doing the same with regard to me. A gentleman on his left hand asked his name, that he might drink to their better acquaintance. Beatman, sir, said the other. James Beatman, younger, of Dumlonin, at your service. One who will never fail a friend at a cheerful glass. I deny the premises, principle and proposition, cried I, springing up and smiting the table with my closed hand. James Beatman, younger, of Dumlonin, you cannot be. I am he. I am the right James Beatman. And I appeal to the parish registers to witnesses innumerable to... Stop, stop, my dear fellow, cried he. This is no place to settle a matter of such moment as that. I suppose all present are quite satisfied with regard to the premises. Let us therefore drop the subject, if you please. Oh, yes, yes, drop the dispute, resounded from every part of the table. No more was said about this strange coincidence, but I remarked that no one present knew the gentleman, excepting those who took him for me. I heard them addressing him often regarding my family and affairs, and I really thought the fellow answered as sensibly and as much to the point as I could have done for my life, and began seriously to doubt which of us was the right James Beatman. We drank long and deep, for the song and the glass went round, and the greatest hilarity prevailed, but at length the gentleman at the head of the table proposed calling the bill, at the same time remarking that we should find it a swinging one. George, bring the bill, that we may see what is to pay. All's paid, sir. All paid? You're dreaming, George, or drunk. There has not been a farthing paid by any of us here. I assure you, all's paid, however, sir. And there's six of claret to come in, and three Glenlivet. Come, George, let us understand one another. Do you persist in asserting that our bill is positively paid? Yeah, certainly, sir. By whom, then? Oh, this good gentleman here, tapping me on the shoulder. Oh, Mr. Beatman, that's unfair, that's unfair. You have taken us at a disadvantage, but it is so like yourself. Is it, gentlemen? Is it indeed so like myself? I'm sorry for it, then. I'll take a bet yon rascal is the right James Beatman after all, for upon the word and honour of a gentleman, I did not pay the bill. No, not a farthing of it. Go, a lad. Oh, the daft tongue of thee, cried a countryman from the other end of the table. Yea, muckle to flee and to rage about. I think the best thing ye can do to oblige us are. 
be to pouch the affront, or I shall take it off the head for half a watching. For I ken thou wast out twice, and stayed a gay bitty well both times. That fool, can't the silly lad. This speech set them in a roar of laughter, and convinced that the countryman was right, and that I, their liberal entertainer, was quite drunk. They all rose simultaneously, and wishing me a good night, left me haranguing them on the falsity of the waiter's statement. The next morning I intended to have gone with the sterling morning coach, but arriving a few minutes too late, I went into the office and began abusing the bookkeeper for letting the cape coach go off too soon. No, no, sir, you wrong me, said he. The coach started at the very minute, but as you had not arrived, another took your place, and here is your money again. The devil it is, said I. Why, sir, I gave you no money, therefore mine it cannot possibly be. Is that your name, Mr. James Beatman? Yes, to be sure it is, but how come you to know my name? Because I have it in the coach book here. See, Mr. James Beatman, paid seventeen shillings sixpence, so here it is. I took the money, fully convinced that I was under the power of some strange enchantment, and ever on these occasions my mind reverted to the little crooked gentleman and the gold snuff-box. From the coach office I hasted to Newhaven to catch one of the steamboats going up the frith. And on the quay, whom should I meet face to face but my whimsical namesake and second self, Mr. James Beatman? I had almost fainted and could only falter out. How is this? You here again? Yes, here I am, said he with perfect frankness. I lost my seat in the sterling coach by sleeping a few minutes too long, but the lad gave me my money again, though I had quite forgot having paid it. And as I must be at Stirling today to meet Mr. Walker, I've taken my passage in the Morning Star of Alloa, and from thence I must post it to Stirling. I was stupefied, bamboozled, dumbfounded, and could do nothing but stand and gape, for I had lost my place in the coach, got my money again, which I never paid, had taken my passage in the Morning Star of Alloa, and proposed posting it to Stirling to meet Mr. Walker. It must have been the devil, thought I, from whom I took the pinch on the Castle Hill. For I am either become two people, else I am not the right James Beatman. I took my seat on one of the sofas in the elegant cabin of the Morning Star. Mr. Beatman Secundus placed himself right over against me. I looked at him, he at me. I grinned, he did the same. But I thought there was a sly leer in his eye which I could not attain, though I was conscious of having the master of it once. And just as I was considering who of us could be the right James Beatman, he accosted me as follows. Yon was truly a clever trick you played us last night, though rather an expensive one to yourself. However, as it made me come off with flying colours, I shall take care to requite it some way, and with interest too. Do you say so? said I. You're a strange wag, and I wish I could comprehend you. I suppose you will be talking of requiting me for the sterling coach hire next. Very well remembered, cried he. I could not recollect of having paid that money, but I now see the trick. You are a strange wag, but here is the sum for you in full. Thank you kindly, sir. Very much obliged to you indeed. Five and thirty shillings into pocket. Good. Ha ha ha, echoed he. And now, sir, if you will be so friendly and affable as to accept the one half of last night's bill from me, just the half, I will take it kind, and shall regard that business as settled. With all my heart, sir, with all my heart, sir, said I. Only tell me this simple question. Do you suppose that I am not the right James Beatman, younger of drum learning? For I tell you, sir, and tremble while I do so, that I am the right James Beatman. And saying so, I gave a tremendous tramp on the floor, on which the captain seized me by the shoulder behind, saying, Who doubts it, sir? No one, I am sure, can be mistaken in that. Come into the starboard chamber here, and let us have something to drink. I went with all my heart. But at that moment I felt my mind running on the old warlock on the castle hill, and I had no sooner taken my seat than on lifting my eyes, there was my companion sitting opposite to me, the same confounded leer on his face as before. However, we began our potations in great good humour. Ginger beer and brandy mixed was the delicious beverage, and we swigged at it till I felt the far-famed morning star begin to twirl round me like a teetoad. Thinking we were going to sink, I clambered above. But all was going on well. With a strong headwind and the ladies mortal sick, I felt quite dizzy, and the roll of the boat rendered it terribly difficult for me to keep my feet. The ladies began to titter and laugh at me, 
They were all sitting on two forms, the one row close behind the other, and I looking miserably bad. And as one freedom courts another, I put the ha my hands in the pockets of my trousers, and steadying myself right in front of them, began an address condoling with them on their deplorable and melancholy faces, and advising them to go down below and drink ginger beer mixed with a little brandy, and there was no fear when unluckily. At this point of my harangue, a great roll of the vessel ruining my equipoise threw me right across four of the ladies, who screamed horribly, and my hands being entangled in my pockets, my head top-heavy and my ears stunned with female shrieks, all that I could do, I could not get up. But my efforts made matters still worse. The ladies, at length, by a joint effort, tumbled me over, but it was only to throw me upon the other four on the next bench, and these I fairly overset. And there was laughing, screaming, clapping of hands, and loud hurrahs, all mixed together. But every person on board was above by this time. I never was so much ashamed in my life, and had no other resource but to haste down once more to the brandy and ginger beer. We drank on and sung until we came near the quay at Alloa. There were five of us, but I had not seen my namesake from the time we first entered. But he never molested me, unless when I was quite sober. But on calling the steward, and inquiring what it was to pay, he told us all was paid for our party. The party stared at one another, and I at the steward, till Mr. Anderson asked who had the kindness, or rather the insolence, to do such a thing. The man said, it was I, but I, being conscious of having done no such thing, denied it with manly oaths, many oaths. Each of the party, however, flung down his share, which the steward obliged me to pocket. I felt myself in a strange state indeed, and quite uncertain whether I was the right James Beatman or not. On going up to the tontine, I found dinner and a chase for sterling ordered in my name, and though feeling quite as if in a dream, I sat down with the rest of our boat party. But scarcely had I taken my seat, ere I was desired to speak with one in another room. There I found the captain, who received me with a grave face and said, hey, This is a very disagreeable business, Mr. Beatman. What is it, sir? Well, about this young lady who was on board. My brother wants to challenge you, but I told him you were a little intoxicated else you were quite incapable of such a thing, and I was sure you would make an apology. I will indeed, sir. I'll make any apology that I shall be required, for, in truth, it was a mere accident, which I could not help, and I'm truly sorry for it. I will make any apology. He then took me away to a genteel house out of the town and introduced me to a most beautiful and elegant young lady, still in teens, who eyed me with a most ungracious look, and then said, Sir... Had it not been for the dread of peril, I would have scorned an apology from such a person. But as matters stand at present, I am content to accept of one. But I must tell you that if you had not been a coward and a poltroon, you never would have presumed to look me again in the face. My dear madam, said I, there is some confounded mistake here. For on the word of a gentleman I declare, and by the honour of manhood I swear, that I never till this moment beheld that lovely face of yours. The whole party uttered exclamations of astonishment and abhorrence on hearing these words, and the captain said, Good God, Mr. Beatman, did you not confess it to me, saying you were sorry for it, and that you were willing to make any apology? Well, because I thought that this had been one of the ladies whom I overthrew on deck, said I, when your unmannerly wave made me lose my equilibrium. But on honour and conscience, this divine creature I never saw before, and if I had, sooner than have offered her any insult, I would have cut off my right hand. The lady declared I was the person. Other two gentlemen did the same, and the irritated brother had me committed for a criminal assault and carried to prison, which I liked very ill. But on being conducted off, I said, Gentlemen, I cannot explain this matter to you, though I understand well enough who is the aggressor. I have, for the last twenty-four hours, been struggling with an inextricable phenomenon. Plague on the old fellow with the gold snuff-box. But I have now the satisfaction of knowing that I am the right James Beatman, after all. There was I given over to the constables and put under confinement till I could find bail, which detained me in Alloa till next day at noon. And ere I reached Sterling, Mr. Walker had gone off to the Highlands without me, at which I was greatly vexed, as he was to have taken me with him in his gig to the braes of Glenorchy, which we were to have shot. Together. I asked the landlord when Mr. Walker went away, and the former told me he only went off that day, but that he had waited four and twenty hours in a companion of his, a strange fish who had got into a scrape with a pretty girl about Alloa, but that he came at last, and Walker and he went off together. This was the clinker. Who was I to think was the right James Beatman now? 
I could get no conveyance for two days, and at length I reached Inverurin, where the only person I found was my namesake, who once more placed himself over against me, and still with the same malicious leer on his face. I accused him at once of the insult to the young lady, which was like to cost me so dear. He shook his head with a leering smile and said, I well knew it was not he who was guilty, but myself, for saving that he was pitched headlong right upon a whole covey of ladies when he was tipsy with ginger beer and brandy, and never so much as seen lady during the passage. You, sir, said I, do you presume to say that you were tipsy with ginger beer and brandy, and that you were pitched upon the two tiers of ladies? Then, sir, let me tell you that you are one of the most notorious impostors that ever lived, the most unaccountable and impalpable being who has taken a fancy to personate me and to cross and confound me in every relation of life. I will submit to this no longer, and therefore pray favour me with your proper address. He gave me my own, on which I got into such a rage at him that I believe I would have pistoled him on the spot, had not Mr Fletcher, the landlord, at that moment tapped me on the shoulder and told me that Mr Watson and Mr Walker wanted me in the next room. I followed him, but in such bad humour that my chagrin could, would not hide, and forthwith accused Mr Walker of leaving me behind and bringing an impostor with him. He blamed me for such an unaccountable joke. The mistake it could not be, for I surely never would pretend to say that I did not come along with him. Mr Watton, an English gentleman, then asked me if I would likewise deny having won a bet from him at angling of five pounds. I begged his pardon and said I recollected of no such thing. Well then. To assist your memory, here's your money, said he. I said I would not take it, but run double or quits with him for the greatest number of birds bagged on the following day. For the real fact was that neither trout nor bait had I taken since I left Edinburgh. Walker and he stared at one another and began a reasoning with me, but I lost all manner of temper at their absurdity and went away to my bed. Never was there a human creature in such a dilemma as I now found myself. I was conscious of possessing the same body and spirit that I ever did, without any dereliction of my mental faculties. But here was another being, endowed with the same personal qualifications, who looked as I looked, thought as I thought, and expressed what I would have said, and more than all seemed to be engaged in every transaction along with me, or did what I should have done, and left me out. What was I next to do? For in this state I could not live. I had become, as it were, two bodies, with only one soul between them, and felt that some decisive measures behoved to be resorted to immediately, for I would much rather be out of the world than remain in it on such terms. Overpowered by these bewildering thoughts, I fell asleep, and the whole night over dreamed about the old man in the gold snuff-box, who told me that I was now himself, and that he had transformed his own nature and spirit into my shape and form. And so strong was the impression that when I awoke I was quite stupid, on going out early for a mouthful of fresh air, my second was immediately by my side. I was just going to break out in a rage at the endless counterfeiting of my person, when he prevented me by beginning first. I'm sorry to see you looking so disturbed this morning, said he. I must really entreat of you to give up this foolery. The joke has worn quite stale, I assure you. For the first day or so it did very well, and was rather puzzling. But now I cannot help pitying you, and beg that you will forthwith appear in your own character and drop mine. Sir, I have no other character to appear in, said I. I was born, christened, and educated as James Beatman, younger of Drumloning, and that designation I will maintain against all the counterfeits on earth. Well, your perversity confounds me, replied he, for you must be perfectly sensible that you are acting a part that is not your own. You are either a rank counterfeit, or what I rather begin to expect, or to suspect, the devil in my likeness. These words overpowered me so much that I fell a-trembling, for I thought of the vision of last night, and what the old man had told me, and the thoughts of having become the devil in my own likeness was more than my heart could brook, and I dare say I looked fearfully ill. Oh, who old cloots you caught, cried he jeeringly. Well, your sublime majesty will choose to keep your distance in future, as I would rather dispense with your society. Sir, I'll let you know that I am not the devil, cried I in great wrath. And if you dare, sir, it shall be tried this moment, and on this spot, who is the counterfeit, and who is the right James Beatman, you or I? Tonight are the sun going down, that shall be tried here, if you change not your purpose before that time, said he. In the meanwhile, let us hide to the moors, for our companions are out, and I have a bet of ten guineas with that Englishman. And forthwith he hated af hasted after the other two, and left me in dreadful perplexity, whether I was the devil or James Beatman. 
I followed to the moors, those dark and interminable moors, Buddha Bridge, but not one bird could I get. They would scarcely let me come in view of them. And moreover, my dog seemed to be in a dream as well as myself. He would do nothing but stare about him like a crazed beast, as if constantly in a state of terror. At the croak of the raven, he turned up his nose, as if making a dead point at heaven, and at the yell of the eagle, he took his tail between his legs and ran. I lost heart and gave up the sport, convinced that all was not right with me. How could a person shoot game while in a state of uncertainty whether he was the devil or not? I returned to Inverurin, and at nightfall Mr. Watton came in, but no more. He was no sooner seated than he began to congratulate me on my success, acknowledging that he was again fairly beat. And pray, how do you know that I beat you? said I. Why, what means this perversity? said he. Did we not meet at six o'clock as agreed and count our birds and found that you had a brace more? You cannot have forgot that. Very well, my dear sir, said I. As I do not choose to give a gentleman the lie against my own interest, I'll thank you for the money. And then I'll tell you what I suppose to be the truth. He paid it. And now, continued I, the devil a bird did I count with you or any other person today for the best of reasons. I had not one to count. As the setting of the sun, as I loaded my pistols and attended at the appointed place, which was in a little concealed dell near the corner of the lake, my enemy met me. We fired at six paces distant, and I fell. Rather a sure sign that I was the right James Beatman, but which of the eyes it was that fell, I never knew till this day, nor ever can. These, sir, were all the incidents that I recollect relating to this strange adventure. When I next came a little to myself, I found myself in this lunatic asylum, with my head shaven and my wounds dressed, and waited upon by a great burly vulgar fellow who refuses to open his mouth to answer to any. Questions of mine. I have been frequently visited by my father and by several surgeons, but they too preserve toward me looks of the most superb mystery, and often lay their fingers on their lips. One day I teased my keeper so much that he lost patience and said, Pray, sir, and you will know the truth. You have drunk it away your seven senses. That's all, so never mind. Now, sir, this vile hint has cut me to the heart. It is manifest that I have been in a state of derangement, but instead of having been driven to it by drinking, it has been solely caused by my wound, and by having been turned into two men acting on various and distinct principles, yet still conscious of an idiosyncrasy. These circumstances, as they affected me, were enough to overset the mind of anyone, and though to myself quite unintelligible, I send them to you, in hopes that by publishing them you may induce an inquiry which may tend to the solution of this mystery that hangs over my fate. I remain, sir, your perplexed, but very humble servant, James Beatman. This letter puzzled me exceedingly, and certainly I would have regarded it altogether as the dream of a lunatic had it not been for two circumstances. These were his being left behind at Stirling, and posting the rest of the road himself, and the jewel and wound at the last. These I could not identify with the visions of a disordered imagination, if there were any proofs abiding. And having once met with Mr. Walker of Crowell at the house of my friend Mr. Steen the distiller, I wrote to him, requesting an explanation of these circumstances, and all others relating to the unfortunate catastrophe which came under his observation. His answer was as follows. Sir, I feel that I cannot explain the circumstances relating to my young friend's misfortune to your satisfaction, and for the sake of his family, who are my near relatives, I dare not tell you what I think, because these thoughts will not conform to human reason. The thing is certain that neither Mr. Watton nor I ever saw more than one person. I took him from Stirling to Inverurin on the Black Mount with me in my own gig, yet, strange to say, a chase arrived at the inn that night, but one after our arrival, with the same gentleman, as we supposed, who blamed me bitterly for leaving him behind. The chase came after dark. Mr. Beatman had been with us on the previous evening, and we had not seen him subsequently till he stepped out of the carriage. These are the facts. Reconcile them if you can. Mr. Beatman's hallucination were first manifested that night. The landlord came in to us and said, I want put the auto with the brave gentlemen into the room. Ah, she forgot in Greek pig tarnation to her with her own self. She put the trunk or hornet. I sent for him. And he came on the instant, but looked much disturbed. On the twelfth he shot as well as ever I saw him do, and was excellent company. But that night he was shot, as he affirms, in a duel, and carried in, dangerously wounded, in a state of utter insensibility, in which he continued for six weeks. This duel is, of all things I ever heard, of the most mysterious. 
He was seen go by himself into the little dell at the head of the lock. I myself heard the two shots, yet there was no other man there that any person knew of, and still it was quite impossible that a pistol could have been fired by his own hand. The ball had struck him on the right side of the head, leaving a considerable fracture, cut the top of his right ear and lodged in his shoulder, so that it must either have been fired at him while in a stooping posture, or from the air straight above him. Both the pistols were found discharged, lying very near one another. That is all that I or any mortal man know of the matter save himself, and though he is now nearly well and quite collected, he is still perfectly incoherent about that. I remain, says yours truly, Alexander Walker, Cromwell, November the 6th, 1827.